Welcome to History Hack. If you didn't know by now, we are the revolution. That means we're sharp, witty, lots of fun, but it also means that we're essentially the peasants in Les Mis huddled round a table in the corner of the bar with no money. If you enjoy the show, please do support us. We have a Patreon account by which you can donate a small monthly sum in appreciation of what you're hearing. Alternatively, we have Ko-fi in which you can just do a one-off donation as a thank you if you particularly enjoy a certain episode. Either way, we massively appreciate all of your support. Hope you enjoy the show. Hello and welcome to your latest edition of History Hack. Today you've got Beth and Chris. How are you? I'm good, thanks Beth. How are you? All good, all good. I'm really looking forward to this one. Do you want to uh, introduce our guests? Absolutely. Uh, This morning we have Carl Shaw, who is a a journalist and a historian who's written several books, including the New York best-selling Royal Babylon, the Mammoth Book of Losers, which has just gone onto my Christmas list, (laughs) and the cautionary tale of five people who have died during sex. (laughs) And But he's here today to talk to us about his new book, The Killing of Lord George, A Tale of Murder and Deceit in Edwardian England. Uh, Carl, how, how are you doing? I'm fine, thank you. Lovely to be talking to you both. I must admit, the first time I read the title, actually several times I've read the title, I kept reading Lloyd George, um, which, is, <laughs> which confused me for a bit. So a lot of people won't have heard who, um, who this is. So could you, should we start off by explaining who Lord George Sanger was and what his background was? Yeah, um, he, he's one of those people who were once incredibly famous and a long time ago and now all but forgotten. He, uh, he was born in 1825. He was the sixth of ten children born to a travelling showman. And his father had actually fought in Nelson's Navy in the Napoleonic War. Um, but at the end of the war, like so many sailors who fought for the country, he found himself homeless and he so he tried his luck as a, a traveling showman uh sort of tramping the countryside with a peep show on his back which is a very basic form of entertainment so little george at the age of five was um, working with his father's show and um george by his early teens he was actually running his own one-man traveling show um I mean, during his life on the road, he endured incredible hardship and he experienced a great deal of violence and saw a lot of violence. And he was also at the receiving end of some of the worst prejudices that um, Victorian society could muster because travelling showmen were seen as little more than criminals. Um, But as a young man, George Sango, he was a very tough, very resilient little guy and he tried his hand at just about anything that would earn him a living. Uh, For a while, he was an acrobat. Then he became a magician, and then he married a lion tamer. (laughs) Um, And then eventually he reinvented himself as a travelling circus proprietor. And before very long, his name was known in every corner of the British Isles, and that was George Sanger. And and because of this, as you say, sort of he develops himself into a a bit of a a celebrity of the time, doesn't he? He's he's very well known, I suppose, when in in this period when your main forms of entertainment are things like travelling shows and travelling circuses. The people who run them must quite naturally become well known. That's absolutely right. Uh, Through the Victorian era and right up until the 1950s, in fact, the name Sanger ran through British circus like a stick of rock. Um, He really was the biggest name in British show business. Now, that might seem like a bit of an exaggeration because few people have heard of him today. But popular show business celebrity, it didn't begin with the music hall. It began with the circus. It was an age when people really didn't travel outside the hometown or village. And circus performers were quite often the only famous performers they'd ever see. And so George was the was the hardest working circus guy of the age, and it was his name that people saw on the circus wagons year in and year out, and and his became the biggest brand name in in show business because he toured relentlessly for nine months a year every year, and he did this for more than half a century, and he used to boast that there wasn't a town or village in the British Isles with a population of more than a hundred people that he hadn't taken the circus too so he did become incredibly famous um he he performed for queen victoria at balmoral Um, he he hobnobbed with the likes of the prince of wales um he loved to name drop and tell people that he was a friend of 
Abraham Lincoln and that he taught Charles Dickens to ride a horse. But <laughs> uh, I've since learned that you had to take a lot of his tales with a pinch of salt because he was quite the storyteller. His wife was very famous too. She was the very first female um, lion tamer in yeah. the UK. And he also toured Europe ex- extensively as well. And he's, so his fame extended well beyond Britain. And he became incredibly wealthy. He was probably the richest and most loved showman of the era. And um, he owned quite a formidable showbiz empire. He had two theatres in London and he owned Britain's very first permanent seaside amusement park in Margate, which is now called Dreamland. Oh, wow. Oh, so even today, still quite far reaching effects. And I just, I, I, lo- I love the fact that his wife was the first like female lion tamer i feel like they would have been like the prop they'd have been like the brad pitt and angelina jolie of their day i imagine <laughs> sort of sort of but <laughs> yes but with lions yeah. <laughs> and she was actually she was mauled quite badly um several times in her career but it was always it was it was good news for circus day you know because people love to go and see the sight of a bad mauling uh. <laughs> as i read the book he came across as a, quite a bit of a, almost a wheeler dealer. And he doesn't have, he doesn't always have the best of luck with animals. What with that, with the wolf pack that escaped through London and he's had continual problems with animals. Yes, indeed. He, um, but, well, there really wasn't anything that he wouldn't do to promote himself. Um, he once deliberately set free a pack of wolves onto the street of Lambeth, just so it would generate a new story. It wasn't quite as, as dangerous as he let on because um the wolves were were relatively tame unless you didn't feed them but he was he really was the master of audacious and spectacularly dangerous publicity stunts he really was a, a wheeler dealer he once uh, hijacked a royal parade that was passing through london on the way to st paul's and queen victoria was in the parade and he just sort of uh, muscled in there with one of his circus floats and it featured um, his wife dressed as Britannia with an actual lion and a lamb at her feet. Um, which he'd, 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 he'd apparently raised them since they were very small. And so they, they, they it, it sort of didn't kick off. <laughs> um, and then, yes, and I said on another occasion, he deliberately set wolves free in Lambeth, which wasn't, um, Health and safety was a bit different in those days, I guess. I mean, his, his wild animals would escape regularly or they would tear the arm off one of the handlers. And um, his, his elephants frequently ran amok and created havoc. Um, but it was always good publicity. Um, in fact, one of George's most famous and most loved elephants was a, a bull called Charlie. And Charlie was a huge favourite, but one day... Charlie killed his handler by trampling him to death and then he went on the run at Crystal Palace. It turned out that the handler had mistreated Charlie the elephant. Mm. Charlie was getting revenge. Eventually, Charlie was sadly executed by a marksman. Um, But it has to be said that George's pressing concern, apart from the loss of his favourite elephant, was posing for a photograph with, with the dead beast, so ensuring that it was in the papers the next day. Yeah. T- t- turning every problem into an opportunity indeed yeah. yeah as you've mentioned carl obviously he was one of these great showmen and as you said as well doing this for over half a century and there ca- ca- comes a time when every businessman must know his limits um and knows that it's time to maybe pass it on to to someone else and he does eventually retire doesn't he in the early 1900s um to park farm i recall uh, yes. And that's where he's spending most of his time, isn't it, in this, in his retirement period? Yeah, sure. Uh, Park Farm in North London had been his winter quarters um, where he kept his animals when he wasn't touring. And people travelling through East Finchley, East Finchley rather, would, would occasionally be alarmed by the sight, sight of elephants grazing in the local fields. And, and, and when he retired from show business, when he was in his 70s, this became his retirement home. Um, and he lived there with several members of his extended family, uh, including his granddaughter and a husband. And there were several farmhands and household servants working for George. And most notably, there was a young man in his 20s who acted as a kind of uh, valet or 
personal assistant to George, and his name was Herbert Cooper. You seeing as you've mentioned her, but Herbert is important character for our viewers, He's for our listeners. <laughs> yes, uh, Herbert is 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 very important in what happens at the end of of um, Lord George Sanger's life. And that's in 1911, isn't it, November? Yes. So one e- one Tuesday evening in late November 1911, um, at around 6 p.m., one of the farm servants, a man called Arthur Jackson, uh, was seen outside Park Farm, and he was staggering in the road with blood all over his face, and he was yelling, help, help, Herbert is murdering us. This was Herbert Cooper, the um, George's assistant. The alarm was duly raised, and uh, when a neighbour entered the farmhouse, he found the elderly George Sanger lying on his back in the front parlour, covered in blood and evidently um, near to death. In fact, uh, George died a few hours later from his injuries. Now, the police were told that the employer, Herbert Cooper, had suddenly gone mad in some random fashion. And he picked up a, a falling axe and he tried to kill two people and then succeeded in killing the old man, George Sanger, as he sat reading by the fireside in his parlour. Um, Herbert Cooper then apparently fled into the night. So the, the police arrived and um, I'm not I'm going to ignore the fact that my great grandfather was a policeman in London at the time. Um, but how <laughs> capable were uh, the Metropolitan Police? Uh, in and the detectives in dealing with uh, with the with the crime and finding the killer. Well, um, the two senior police detectives assigned to the case were very experienced men, and they were assumed to be among the very best that the Metropolitan Police could offer. And uh, they had quite a large team of local officers working for them. Um, but there had been something like a two and a half delay in reporting the crime. And now this was later blamed on a number of factors. Um, there was no phone at the farm. Um, the first Bobby on the scene uh, trusted a passing cyclist to get a message back to HQ. And the cyclist rode off and was never seen again. Um, when detectives finally arrived at the crime scene, they found it swarming with people. Um, word had got around and there were several more members of George Sanger's family there. And because of the delay in reporting the incident before any pursuit of um, the, um, the fugitive could commence in earnest, um, the supposed perpetrator, Herbert Cooper, he had a head start of more than three hours. So it wasn't the best start. Frankly, it was a bit of a farce. And that, unfortunately, set the tone for the whole investigation. It was a bit of a shambles. At, at this time, because obviously the main source of, of information is going to be the newspapers and so on, how was this reported in the press? Was it reported as, you know, was it was it one of the big stories of the day? Oh, yeah. The, the manhunt for George Sanger's killer, um, it was one of the biggest of the era. I mean, London was the world's most populous city and it had a, around 7 million people, but cold-blooded murders were really rare. Um, and the death of an internationally famous showman made the next day's newspapers and was received with horror and disparate belief. You know, the, the brutal slaying of a defenceless old man was one thing. Um, the idea that it was done in his own home in a frenzied axe attack by a trusted employee was quite another. So the press really went to town mm. and um, it was reported that Park Farm was a total bloodbath. Um, the press said that Herbert Cooper had rushed into the parlour armed with a razor in one hand and an axe in the other and without warning had basically... Um, butchered everybody in the room, which was a, a, a complete fabrication, actually. There were various graphic descriptions in the press about how he rained blows at George Sanger's head with an axe. And um, pretty much all of the first newspaper reports claimed that the attack was completely motiveless and that Herbert Cooper had just suddenly become unhinged. Mm. And uh, there was really no question that Herbert Cooper did it. 
the press reported that he was a man of enormous size and strength and of violent temperament, which wasn't really true at all. And over the next few days, the, the press were, were keen at every opportunity to remind their readers that Herbert Cooper was a violent, unstable character, and he was referred to as a madman or insane. And really, every scrap of information and rumour about him, no matter how trivial or misleading, was presented as fact by the press. As you said, the newspaper said that there was no reason for it and tried to describe him as this violent man. What Was there any sort of reason for why he had allegedly committed this murder that we know of? Um, without giving away the very ending, um, it was it was alleged that some money had gone missing at Park Farm and that um, the finger of dis- suspicion was pointed at Herbert Cooper. Right. As a result of this, um, it cost him his job. He was allowed to stay on at the farm as a general labourer, but the sort of prize plum job of being personal assistant to George was given to another man. Right. And the theory was that um, Herbert Cooper had um, become jealous of this other guy and it had all kicked off and that he'd it was a revenge attack and that he'd um, suddenly, you know, lost his marbles. That was the theory, anyway. There's, there's more to the story of, of that night, though. Um, Robert, uh, two gentlemen called Robertson Potter find something near Stanhope Railway Station on the 30th of November. What, what did they find? Yeah, so the manhunt went on for a couple of days. A couple of days later, a train passenger at Highgate Station in North London reported that he thought he'd seen a body on the railway line. And when a couple of railway employees went to investigate, um, they found a decapitated um, body on the line, and it was Herbert Cooper, the, the wanted man. And from the position of the body, it was clear that he'd, he'd laid down by the side of the line and placed his head on the rail and was killed by a passing train. And they searched his body and they found a suicide note scribbled in pencil. And actually, when I was researching this book in the Metropolitan Archives in London, um, I found hidden amongst the coroner's case files uh, the actual suicide note. It wasn't a copy. It was the actual note. Oh, wow. And that, that, that was quite an affecting um, discovery that really did, um, you know, m- make the hairs on the back of the neck stand up. And I had to, I realised then I had to treat the story with great respect. Yeah. So it suddenly makes the whole thing more real, that there's like that personal connection to the uh, the people in the event. It did, yeah. It very much did, yeah. With, with that note, I'm guessing obviously then that would have been used, you would hope, at the inquest into into his death um but the inquest starts to show cracks in this story doesn't it of well he's just murdered him in cold blood and he's then committed suicide the start the cracks start to show down there the truth starts to appear i suppose it did yes um no one was ever brought to trial for the murder of joyce sanger obviously because the supposed assailant herbert cooper had taken his own life um but there had to be a coroner's inquest And that attracted huge international interest. Um, At this inquest, the jury really had no hesitation in deciding that Herbert Cooper had murdered George Sanger with an axe. Um, There were people there at the farm on the night of George's death who more or less stuck to the version of events that they told the police. But there were, in fact, quite a lot of contradictory statements And it became clear that all was not quite as it seemed. The forensic evidence didn't really stack up either. But I think the police um, were, in fairness, a little bit overwhelmed by dealing with such a big name as Lord George Sanger. And I think they were very keen. There was a lot of pressure on to get a result as soon as possible. And... His suicide, as far as the police, the press, and, and just about everyone else who'd been following the case was concerned, that was absolute proof that he did it. Although there was nothing incriminating in the suicide note, um, it was good enough. And um, there was no question that was the end of it. Um, the man 
you know, the man at whom the finger of suspicion was being pointed by everyone committed suicide within days of the supposed murder. So there really was an overwhelming temptation to presume his guilt and wrap the, the case up quickly without looking too hard at the evidence under the noses, I'm afraid. The police quite, I can see on paper that it is quite an open and shut case. You know, um, witnesses claim man's come in, attacked him with an axe, man turns up dead. Shot. Yes, that, yes, it really, it really was. It really was about that. Um, and also, the Crown had a, a gentleman called Sir Bernard Spilsbury on their side, and his name crops up quite a lot during this era. And he was regarded as um, he was almost the Sherlock Holmes of the era. You know, he was a forensic detective. And if Bernard Spilsbury said that um, George Sanger was hit over the head with an axe, then that was good enough for everybody. Mm. But since then, Bernard Spilberry's reputation has, and quite a few, is, has been called into question in quite a few cases since. Mm. Inclu including uh, Dr. Crippen? Yes, indeed. That's the most famous one that he was involved in, and that is um, all, also not as straightforward as it seemed. Mm. Um, I just wanted to touch on very briefly... Um, with the, the the suicide note that, as you said, that you you found the actual suicide note, does does Cooper actually write it in the suicide note that he that he did it? Is is that used as a sort of to add to this open and shut element of the case? Did he admit to actually killing Sanger? He, he, he very much didn't. I mean, that the the, um, the suicide note was read out, of course, in the inquest, but there was nothing incriminating in it. It was very much uh, a note written by somebody who was very confused. Yeah. He, wrote, he wrote to his dad and he said, there's, there's something happened at the farm. I don't know what happened. There's something There's something bad happened, but um, I know I'm in trouble. Um, and then he was, he, he, he was kind of, he, he was defensive, but he didn't incriminate himself. It very much seemed as though, this was this was a man who was, who was writing suicide note then laid his head on a railway line. I can't imagine what was running through his mind at the time, but he was clearly very distressed. But no, he didn't turn up to the murder. Right. Later on, um, one of um, Sanger's relatives, George Coleman, said that uh, Cooper was, a quote, uh, more sinned against than sinning. So it was definitely seem like there's a lot more to this case than is believed and maybe Henry is not as guilty but I, again I, I don't want to give away any spoilers but it, do, it does appear that he's not as guilty as everyone in at the time thought he, he was. Yes uh, in the years that followed uh, George Sanger's death there, there was all this, always this kind of lingering suspicion within the Sanger, Sanger family that the whole truth about what happened at Park Farm that evening hadn't really been told. Now, there's a guy called George Coleman. He was the grandson of George Sanger, and he was also a very well-known circus performer. And uh, Mr. Coleman was also one of those who thought there was something very fishy going on because he knew Herbert Cooper, and he really couldn't imagine him wanting him to harm his grandfather. So... Um, in, the, in 1952, George Coleman published his autobiography, and in these memoirs, he revealed a family secret that had been told to him not long after his grandfather's death and had never previously been revealed. And the gist of it was that he had very good reason to believe that um, Herbert Cooper had been unjustly vilified. Um, but... Forty years had passed since the events at Park Farm, and the book and his comments sort of went under the radar. Um, but I had access to something that George Coleman didn't, because after the coroner's inquest, the police files and everything else that was associated with the case was 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 sealed from public view for seventy five years. Mm. That was routine in murder cases, so I've been able to look at the police files and the inquest transcripts with fresh eyes. Um, I could tell from the binding. I mean, so these files would have been available to the public from about 1986, but I could tell from the bindings. I would guess that I was probably the first person that, that had seen them for more than 100 years, actually. And so 
when I set out to research George Sanger, it was really to write a book about his amazing life. I didn't know that I'd got a true crime story on my hands. I hadn't really thought much about his death, except that it was this strange and tragic footnote, and I really didn't expect to find anything revelatory. But at the National Archives, I, as I said, I judged the condition of the files. I was the first to look at them. And there was a pink folder tied with ribbon with a sheaf of brittle papers with dozens of legal documents, with verbatim statements from the witnesses. And I, I experienced the thrill of turning over in my hands documents that perhaps no one else had touched for more than 100 years. So then it became clear to me that I was writing quite a different book, actually, than the one I'd set out to write. Uh, I, I won't give away the ending, but I think anyone reading it will find it as shocking as I did. Um, it's very cl clear that the police and, and everyone else got it wrong. And actually, I was talking about this to a member of the National Press, a crime writer, a couple of weeks ago, who, you know, he reads the, these kind of books all the time. He told me he thought it was the most obvious miscarriage of justice he'd ever come across. Yeah, I must admit, when I, I read I, when I was doing the prep for this and reading the book, I, I was riveted. It was it was a really interesting case. And like you said, it does look like the police have gone for uh, almost the easy option of like, there we go, done. It's all over, but without doing any proper police work, as it were. Yes, I'm afraid that was the case. Um, and I think there's compelling evidence in the book to suggest that that was the case. Yeah. So um, if anyone, um, anyone who's listening wants to find out more, and you really should, because this is actually a really interesting case, uh, you can buy Carl's book. Carl, would you mind uh, reminding our listeners uh, the title of your book and where they could get it? Um, it's called The Killing of Lord George, and it's available from all of the usual suspects online or on the high street and we'll uh i'll speak to the powers of beasts if we can get it on the uh history hack online bookshop as well that way um we can stop amazon from firing rockets into space carl gets some more money we get a small slice and um you get a <laughs> brand new book <laughs> lovely <laughs> yeah but, carl, it's been great speaking to you um, about this it's been this is a really interesting story my pleasure my pleasure thank you so much carl our incredible guests give us 45 minutes of their time to join us and talk about their work or their new book. This is just a small taster. As a result, we have launched our very own bookshop on bookshop.org, where you can find our guests' latest books, you can support them, and you can support us on History Hack. 10% of every sale via our bookshop supports the podcast and allows us to keep going and bring you more top-of-the-line guests. You can find our bookshop at bookshop.org forward slash shop forward slash history hack or search for us in the shop section thank you so much for your continued support we really appreciate our listeners and supporters so make sure you get down to the bookshop and grab yourselves a new book <laughs>